Basically, Ireland was settled about uh, 9000 BC in what's known as the Mesolithic or Middle Stone Age. And these people were nomads. They effectively moved from place to place, lived in temporary encampments. They followed available food resources, so they may move to a river when salmon were running or move in land when uh, wild pigs or whatever were, were, were um, rotting seasons and things like that. So they moved around at certain times of the year in search of food and their economy was based on the animals they hunted and the edible berries, roots, tubers, etc. that they gathered. So a nomadic lifestyle moving around in the landscape, no permanent settlements. These are just some idealized, I suppose, reconstructions of what these encampments might have looked like and this is one on a coastal margin. The earliest evidence for settlement in Kerry dates to around 53, 5400 BC at Ferreter's Cove on the tip of the Dingle Peninsula and is one of these sort of coastal encampments probably only used seasonally at certain time of the year when food resources were available. Basically we have a lifestyle where you have hunters and gatherers gathering you know, fruits, tubers, whatever at certain times of the year. Now it's estimated that about three and a half days of hunting and gathering would be enough to feed a family or whatever for a week. The landscape in Ireland at this time was very heavily wooded, so why we find these settlements mainly in river valleys and coastal margins is because this is where the forest is less dense. But you're talking effectively about a dense wooded environment with populations, probably not a huge number of people over the whole country, settled in river valleys and on coastal margins where the forest was less dense. So there's no effort at this time really to clear the forest or to alter the environment in any way. Now the big change, if you like, comes around 4200 BC um, with the adoption of agriculture. And in an Irish context, we seem to have adopted the keeping of domesticated animals first and, if you like, the cultivation of the soil and the growing of crops came afterwards. There's no evidence in Ireland for any cultivated uh, cereals or anything prior, prior to about 3700 BC. And you see this kind of idealized landscape, you've gone from tents and things like that to wooden houses um, built of posts and planks roofed in thatch with three aisles in the interior, sleeping compartments and a central aisle for daily living. You can see also the beginnings of land enclosure with fencing used to keep animals in, domesticated animals in. There is idealized again crop uh, planting at the top and at the bottom here you see uh, the community involved in the construction of a megalith megalithic tomb. This particular type of tomb is a court tomb which at one point was thought to be the earliest of the four main types of megalithic tombs but uh, excavations at Paul Nebron and the Burn and Kilitlehan would suggest that uh, portal tombs are possibly slightly earlier. So basically we've gone from hunting and gathering to sowing crops and keeping animals, tilling the soil. So it's a huge change in lifestyle and because you're now settled the whole issue of land ownership becomes important because you're dependent on that land for your food resources, land to keep your animals on. You're now building houses that are reasonably permanent. About 25 years would be the estimated lifespan of one of those wooden houses and you're not moving around after food resources. Hunting and gathering probably still played uh, a substantial part in the economy in the early part of the Neolithic and this decreased as we move on through the period. This is uh, a, again a reconstruction of a core tomb like the one that was being built in the last slide and uh, you, what you, hear, you see here basically is some form of ritual prior to an interment in the tomb. These tombs are, have been regarded as communal tombs in the past it now appears, based on evidence in Paul Nebron, that they may not have been communal tombs at all, that very, very few people were put into them rather than large numbers, particularly in this early phase, and that they may, evidence from Paul Nebron suggests they were not actually from the locality at all. So how we explain that is going to be difficult. So the whole idea of everybody in a community being buried in one of these tombs is, is, is under a bit of challenge at the moment. And this is a reconstruction of what, if you like, a portal tomb was thought to look like when the museum was opened 25 years ago, um, completely covered in a cairn of stone. The evidence from Paul Nebron and Killetlehem would suggest that these monuments were not entirely covered. 
that the chamber was visible when they were in use. So the differences between the Mesolithic and the Neolithic. In the Mesolithic, you're a hunter-gatherer, you're nomadic. There is no land ownership. Effectively, everything is communally owned and people move around freely in the landscape. Burial is simple burial in pits. And in fact, the oldest Mesolithic burial in Western, northwestern Europe was excavated in Limerick. There's no pottery. There's a limited range of tools. And you live according to the natural cycle, as we've just said, Basically, food resources at certain times of the year when you're available, you exploit those, and when they're not, you move on to the next one that's available. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, in the Neolithic, you're a farmer. You're settled in one place. There's a misprint there. Land ownership is important. Complex burial monuments begin to be built. You have pottery. You have a wider range of tools, and you're creating a cycle of food production that's often contrary to the natural cycle. And what I mean by that is that you're now dependent on rain at certain times of the year, sun at certain times of the year. You need the land to be maintained fertile. You're actually altering your landscape, if you like. You're cutting down the forest to create open land to farm. So it's completely different, uh, if you like, living within and without the natural cycle in these two periods. Now, the portal tombs at Killetlahan, there are actually three tombs in the townlands of Killetlahan and Brack Hill. Kilitlahan is a large townland to the east of the town of Milltown in Mid Kerry, and the red star there marks where the tombs are. So there are three tombs. Kilitlahan 1 was excavated in 2015. Kilitlahan 2 is actually in a woodland and was partially excavated this year uh, in June of this year. And Brackill in the adjoining townland, has, we've not done any work there yet. Kilitlahan 2 and Brackill are collapsed. Kilitlahan 2 was still just about standing when we excavated it in 2015. This is a LiDAR image uh, taken by bouncing radio signals off the ground surface from an aeroplane, measuring the time to, they take to come back in order to create a three-dimensional image of the landscape. And you can see there's a, a raised elevated ridge here at the bottom of the photograph. Uh, this stretches all the way from Milltown to Farron 4. And the three tombs are located in very low-lying areas in hollows where they would not have been visible until you literally were right on top of them. And they have views only to one half of the compass, in, in, in all three cases only to the northern half of the compass. And they're actually so low down that even the, the sea at Castle Main Harbour cannot be seen. So the views are limited enough. The sleeve mish is probably the main aspect of, of, of all three tombs. And this is just a close-up of the location at Killetlahan 1, which was excavated in 2015. And you can see quite clearly it's located in a fold in the landscape where it would have had no views to one side and where you would not really see the tomb until you've approached it, probably from the, the north. This was the condition of the tomb in 2015 in February prior to the excavation. And you can see that the two portal stones are leaning heavily to one side and the capstone is effectively bearing down on one of them which is now only held in place by a stone wedged in by the landowner, Kenneth O'Neill, when he began to see this, uh, the, the collapse increasing each year. So the first thing we had to do was remove the capstone. The capstone was green sandstone and weighed 13 and a half tonnes. Uh, following a bit of geological analysis and that of the stone, it's likely that it's a glacial erratic. Uh, the nearest source of that type of stone is the sleeve mish. But carrying it the eight kilometres from the Sleeve Mish, lower slopes of the Sleeve Mish, to Kilitlahan would involve crossing the River Main, which is likely not to have been possible. So the geological opinion is that the capstones of all three tombs in this area are glacial erratics. The first thing we did then was we carried out what's known as a geophysical survey of the site. This involves uh, basically x-raying, if you like, the ground, what's underneath the ground, using a number of techniques. Uh, the one that actually worked best here in Kilitlaham was what's called resistivity, where electrical resistance of, of various uh, layers in the soil is measured. And this can often tell you where archeological features that are buried are located. What we were really trying to work out was the extent of the site uh, and how far any care material that was on the monument might extend. And this is the tool that was used. It's, your resistivity meter on top with probes that stick into the ground on the bar at the base. 
This is the site on the first day of the excavation with an area of approximately seven by four meters stripped. And you can see that there is kind of a heavy amount of care material in the very, very center. And it begins to peter out very close to the edge of the area that is stripped. So effectively, there isn't a huge amount of cairn or a large cairn around this chamber. It's a, the cairn material is very tight to the monument and the whole site probably no more than 10 metres uh, at its longest in one direction and maybe six and a half metres in the other. This is the site in mid-excavation and you can see that one of the portals was, was badly cracked uh, and you can see the crack on it at the far side. Um, as we excavated and took off the smaller stone from the, t from the top, it became clear that there was a pit. Um, and this is likely to be the pit from where the capstone had been excavated. So what you're looking at on construction here really is that they went and found a glacial erratic that was going to be suitable for a capstone. They dug it out and they raised it then onto the two portals and refilled this pit, which effectively then, then became the chamber of the tomb with very large stones at the base and smaller stones above that. Now all of the soil that was uh, taken from Killeclahan was actually wet sieved on site because we had access to water. And this is a picture of Gemma, who some of you have probably seen this morning or know from visits to the museum, uh, sieving some of the soil to make sure that even the smallest pieces of bone or whatever are recovered from the excavation. This is the site at the end of the excavation with the two portals now propped back into an upright position. And you can see at the back of the two portals, you have two stones left in situ that effectively are the sill stones of the tomb, a common enough feature in megalithic tombs that divides, if you like, the little entrance between the two portals from the burial chamber proper. And you can see that basically what you're left with is a pit from where the, probably the capstone was excavated. Interestingly, at the back, you can see a large dump of very big stones and it's fair, we're fairly certain at this stage that the tomb was dug into at least once, if not twice, because even after, probably shortly after construction, there were issues with the stability of the capstone. When they found the stone, they, they probably didn't take a great look at the back of it, and the back of it is very uneven. And it appears that from an early date, the stone at all times was beginning to slide backwards and slide to one side. And it appears they dug in at the back here and attempted to prop up or stabilize the back of the stone to prevent this happening. Now, it was successful to a point in that the tomb stayed standing till 2015, but the collapse was being caused effectively by this movement of the rear of the capstone, which they had tried to repair at least twice. This is the site then on the, the last day, if you like. We at this stage have um, propped the two portals back in place and put a, a grid of structural steel and a cement platform between the two of them to both repair the crack in one of them and to keep the two of them in position. A boulder that was visible in the tomb from the first day in the centre has been replaced and we've taken one of the big stones from the fill of the pit and placed it at the back to use as a stop to prevent the capstone from moving backwards like it had been. And this is the final act, if you like, the replacement of the 13.5 tonne capstone on the two re-erected portals. And this is the tomb basically as it looks today. And you can see the capstone now resting on the two portals. And we have filled the gap at the back where the stone was uh, moving to one side with boulders from the fill of the pit. So everything is original, nothing new put into it. Basically, a small cement platform between the two portals is all that has been done with modern materials to, to keep the monument upright. And this is a plan of the tomb in mid-excavation with all of the finds from the excavation marked. The areas, the areas here in yellow are where cremated bone was recovered. The black circles are where flint artifacts were recovered. And then we have pottery of three different dates. The blue is very er early Neolithic pottery. The pinky color is middle Neolithic pottery. And the green color is uh, early Bronze Age pottery. So even from the pottery and the finds alone, you can see that there were burials put into the tomb at three different points in prehistory. At the very earliest Neolithic, around 3,900, 4,000 BC 
in the Middle Neolithic around 3600 BC and in the Early Bronze Age around 2500 BC. The red one here is actually a, where we found a silver groat uh, of Henry VIII dating to 1523, um, which again indicates that either somebody lost this on visiting the site or deliberately threw it into the site for good luck or whatever. So it was being visited into the 16th century. Um, so the site had retained an importance in the landscape and in local, if you like, folk memory for thousands of years and right up to the present day, as we'll see. There was a number of flint artifacts, all would be regarded as, as, as excellent examples of their type and the work of, of, of a master flint napper. This is uh, a flint knife. Uh, it's over 10 centimetres in length. It was the first find that was made at the tomb. And like all of the artifacts, this was scientifically analysed. And this is just to give you an idea of how this is done. This is the, the knife with areas where evidence for wear and use, etc., were noted on the edges of the blade. And these are micrographs or photographs taken of um, electron microscope uh, studies of the, the knife. Now, what we can tell about the knife from these studies is that it had a handle of either wood or bone. The handle had, like you often see uh, in these reconstructions, been held in place by um, skin bindings or leather bindings. But equally, there was evidence that a resin or like glue, a resin, probably from pine, had been used to hold the handle in place. And there was evidence of wear all along the edges. Now, what was interesting about this is the air was very much, wear was very much concentrated on one side, side, which may indicate the left or right handedness of the person that was using it. And I suppose more interestingly, again, it appears to have been used extensively for cutting plant matter. Now, this could be evidence of it being used to harvest cereals, but as I say, this knife is probably at least 300 years earlier than uh, the earliest evidence we have in Ireland for cultivated cereals. But it may have been used for gathering roots, tubers, etc., as part of the diet. Because as I said to you earlier on, even with the adoption of agriculture, at this early stage, you're probably talking about low-level food production and hunting and gathering is still playing a substantial part in the subsistence economy. These are three arrowheads that were recovered from the excavations as well. They're a type called lozenge-shaped arrowheads, again dating to the very earliest phase of the Neolithic, around 3900 BC. Two of them, all three were analyzed, but two of them had evidence of use. This smaller one here had been fractured here, and there was a fracture across here from striking bone probably, uh, so it had been used in hunting. This one had also been used, but interestingly the white one here had never actually been used. There was no evidence of any wear on it, and it suggested that it may have been made very specifically for inclusion in the burial. And this is again is just uh, showing you how this wear is analysed, the marks mark evidence for use, and these are shots of the electric, electron microscope scans of the arrowhead. This is the tools that were found as a group, the knife, the three arrowheads. There was also two scrapers that were also analysed. This is what's known as a hollow scraper and had evidence of being used to work wood, probably remove bark or whatever from, maybe even from the shafts, wood to be used for the shafts of arrowheads. And this is a borer, uh, we think, probably used to put holes in leather and it had a polish on it that you get from working animal skins. Now there was pottery, as I said, also found. So I'm just going to show you some of the pieces of the very early Neolithic pottery as that's what we're kind of focusing on. And this is a type of pot called a carinated bowl. Uh, again, dates to the very earliest phase of the Neolithic. And it's the first type of pottery, as far as we know today, it ever used in Ireland. Um, and a replica of this pot was made by Lone, who's out in the fire later on, We're using clay that she dug up from right beside the tomb. And you can see that the coloration and consistency of both is very similar, suggesting that it is likely the pot, this pot and the one I'm going to show you next were actually made with clay from the locality and possibly right beside the tomb itself. The second type of early pot we got is called a bipartite bowl. Again, this is the only example of this type of pot, not alone in Kerry, but in Munster, uh, which again is important. And this is a replica of the pot made by Lone again with clay from the tomb. 
Now, a lot of the dating evidence we have for the tomb comes from artifacts and pottery, but there's also radiocarbon dating. And radiocarbon dating works on the basis that the carbon-14 isotope, there's a set amount of it in the atmosphere, or was up until the 1950s, when nuclear testing, etc., increased the number of C-14 isotopes in the atmosphere. And carbon-14 decays at a set rate, so if you measure the amount of, and all living things absorb carbon-14, so if you measure the amount of carbon-14 in something at its death, if you like, or when it's burnt in the case of wood, um, you can actually tell its age. So you get an age in, in what's known as radiocarbon years. Now these are the dates from Kilitlahan, and basically you can see they're all over the place for want of a better word. There are dates literally stretching from the 1950s all the way back to 4685 BC, which is actually Mesolithic rather than Neolithic. Now the problem with these two earliest dates is they're from oak. And there is an effect called the old wood effect, in, which basically means that an oak tree could be hundreds of years old, so the date could equally be hundreds of years earlier than it reads. Now, even if the, the oak used at Kilitlahan was 600 years old, it still puts the date at 4000 BC. Unfortunately, cremation was the only burial rite we got evidence for at Kilitlahan, and the only woods in Ireland that will get born to a high enough temperature to cremate are oak. So the earliest dates were always likely to come from oak, but unfortunately we had no uh, sap wood or twigs of oak that we were able to date that would give, get rid of this old wood effect. But the dates are still likely to be at the phase of the 39400 BC because, as I say, even if the tree was 685 years old at its at time it was cut down, the date is around 4000 BC. But you can also see that we have dates from the Bronze Age, which we have burial evidence for as well, but we also have dates in the medieval period, the early Bronze Age, the late Bronze Age, Iron Age transition, and in the early medieval period. Again, all evidence that the site was visible in the landscape, was visited, was disturbed, was investigated. So as well as the three phases of burial, there was other disturbance subsequently after the early Bronze Age, indicating that the site retained a degree of importance. And this then is how radiocarbon dates, just to clear up how we arrive at these calendar dates, are calibrated. And you can see here basically that you have what's known as a calibration curve. So here are the radiocarbon years. And based on the curve, these are roughly then the calendar years. And when you send a, a radiocarbon date away, this is from Bone from Kilitlahan, you get a lab number, that's the sample ID, and you get an age in radiocarbon years. And then you get a calibration of that based on two probabilities, 68% and 95%. And then these are, these are the ages you're effectively given. So, the curve then that comes with the dates just basically shows you where the radiocarbon years, where they intersect the curve most often, and you have your bracketed dates in radiocarbon years and in calendar years. So after Kilitlahan II would be next in 2015, we looked at the second tomb in Kilitlahan townland in Kilitlahan Wood, and this structure had collapsed completely. So we weren't certain it was a portal tomb, or even that it was a megalithic tomb at all, to be honest. The capstone here is much, much longer than the one at Kilitlahan. It's almost five and a half meters in length. Similar weight, but it's a much, much longer stone. Again, uh, geological input would suggest it's a glacial erratic, and we'll see that this would tie in with the evidence from a small excavation done there this year. So we remove the smaller broken piece of the capstone, and underneath it we begin to find a very, very rough wall composed of very large stones. And we can also see that there is the edge, a dip down into a pit, similar to the one at Kilitlahan one. So again, this stone probably dug out, a glacial erratic dug out of the ground on the site. You can see the fill of the pit here again, like Kilitlahan one, very large stones at the bottom and smaller stones above it. And you can see this wall is very substantial. This stone here, for instance, is when we excavated down its full length, is almost 80 centimetres in length. Very, very big stones at the base of this wall. This is the chamber, and you can see, like Kilitlahan one, and contrary to the classic notion of a, a dolmen or a, a tripod portal tomb, this, like Kilitlahan one, has no rear stone. The rear of the capstone rests on the ground surface. 
So here, this just gives a better idea. You can see this pit where the capstone was probably dug out of. You can see that it has been edged in very large stones. And then we have this very rough wall, uh, arc of walling at one side, not stretching back the full, way, the full width of the stone, about two thirds of the way back. And what this seems to be is that this might explain how the, the stones were raised in place. And what it looks like is that you find your glacial erratic, you dig it out of the ground, and you're basically lifted up using wooden levers, and you shove in big stones to hold it in place while you drop it again to reset the levers, lift it again, and continue raising this very rough wall of large stones on either side to keep the stone up until you have enough room that you can dig out the pit completely and wedge the two portal stones underneath. It's important to remember that in neither of these tombs were the portal stones in sockets. So they weren't in holes dug in the ground specifically for them and packed with stones. They were literally just wedged under the capstone. So we haven't analyzed all of the stuff from Killittle Hand 2 yet, needless to say, and we will be going back to it this year. But as an indicator of date, we have this leaf-shaped arrowhead, which is regarded typologically as earlier than the lozenge-shaped arrowhead and again indicates a date in that period around 3900 to 4000 BC. And we also have a scraper, but neither of these have been properly analyzed as yet. So why are the tombs in Kilitlan important? The tombs in Kilitlan are the oldest extant structures in the county, and they're unquestionably the oldest burial monuments in Kerry. They're a monument basically to the death of one lifestyle, the hunter-gatherer lifestyle, and the hugely significant adoption of agriculture because you only begin to build tombs like this when you begin to settle in one place because they're statements not alone of, of your ability to alter the environment, but they're statements of land ownership. And land ownership, as we said, does become important. And tying yourself to one area of land through ancestral tombs or whatever becomes important and continues right up to this day in many ways. Ways. It provides an insight into how these tombs were built because very few of these tombs were ex have been excavated. There was a few excavated in the early years of the, of the 20th century. Paul Nebron was excavated in the Burn in 1986 and these two at Killet Lahan in 2015 and partially the second one in 2017. And they do give us an idea how they were built and they've changed the two most recent excavations, Paul Nebron and Killet Lahan, have changed our idea of even what they looked like. As I said to you, the cairn doesn't cover the whole chamber. What we reckon now is that the cairn, both here and at Powell and Braun, was basically only, how would you put it, almost like structural steel itself, stabilizing the whole structure, holding the portal stone, to, stones in place, and that the chamber was visible when the tomb was in use. Excavation showed that it was still in use at least 1,500 years after it was built. That's the three phases of burial. But equally, as we've seen, it was an important feature in the landscape right up to recent times. It's the first attempt at architectural, or if you like, artistic expression in Kerry. It expresses a spiritual concept or belief, but also the ownership of land and an ability to shape the environment. And it indicates a possible route for settlement expansion in Kerry. Now, as some of you probably know, we have, and I've just mentioned we earlier on, we have evidence for a Mesolithic encampment at Ferreter's Cove. There are also dates for Mesolithic activity on Valencia Island. And even despite these being known of in the late 80s, I mean, there are textbooks written in the early 90s that would still have assumed that Kerry was largely unoccupied by people up until the Bronze Age when copper resources on the Ivra and Beira peninsulas became important. But during the Celtic Tiger excavations, particularly around Tralee, produced an awful lot of uh, evidence for uh, early Neolithic. There's an early Neolithic date from a site at Gortinora and Dingle. And recently, excavations at the site of the ESB power station in Kilpadog near Tarbert have uncovered a small little Neolithic, if you like, village of three houses and possibly two uh, shed or whatever type structures as well. So we have a situation where you have the late Mesolithic settlement in the coastal fringe. and now we know that there is early Neolithic material here as well in Killitlehan. Both of these areas, interestingly, in the valleys of major rivers, the Lee in the case of Tralee and the Main in the case of, of, of Killitlehan. So a possible likely route is that maybe these um, 
if you like, late Mesolithic settlers here actually began to move inland and move in along either the coastal fringe, as we've said, where the forest is less dense, or alternatively by boat, which they were quite capable of using. Because you have to remember all the domesticated animals that are in Ireland, none of them are native. They all had to come in probably by boat. So by boat along the coast, in along the coastal fringe, into these two areas. Now, are these the only areas in Kerry likely to have evidence of early Neolithic? Probably not. I mean, other major rivers like the Cashin or the Lown or even the Inni here in, in South Kerry may also have such evidence, but because excavation hasn't been carried out, you have to remember all of these dates in the Tralee area, for instance, were recovered as a result of excavation. Um, and again, some monuments may have been misidentified. You have to remember that the three tombs in this area have been known about by everybody living there for you know, however long, but haven't come to the attention maybe of archaeologists or scientists or whatever until quite recently. So I leave it at that. Thank you.